Alrighty. <clears throat> Hope you guys had a good weekend. Today we're going to be reading a paper um, called Vision Language Pre-Training Basics, Recent Advances, and Future Trends. So this is a uh, relatively recent survey paper. Um, coming out of Microsoft's research group. So survey papers are uh, long papers that try to kind of summarize a specific field or subfield, and they're very good for finding citations and uh, getting up to date on all the different research in an area. So specifically here, this is a uh, vision language pre-training. Um, so the combination of kind of large vision models, large language models, and all the different permutations that you can create from those. Uh, multimodal refers to multiple modalities, right, with one modality being vision and the other modality being language. Okay, we group these approaches into three categories, image text, uh, core computer vision, right? Actually, maybe rather than highlighting core computer vision, we'll say image classification, object detection, right? So bounding box, and then segmentation which is masks. And then the third category is video text, such as video captioning, video text retrieval, and video question answering. So lots of different sub-problems, all of them dealing with uh, using text and video to solve something here, or video is really image, so they're all kind of variants of the same thing. Present a comprehensive review and discuss the progress, as well as the challenges. Uh, they also talk about a couple other things, such as big foundation models, which have kind of dominated the image or the vision and the language space, uh, unified modeling, right, and in context view shot learning, knowledge, robustness, and computer vision in the wild. Uh, I like this little spade here. This basically talks about who did what. Uh, all of these are people in uh, Microsoft. All right, so this being a summary paper, survey paper, there's a lot of stuff here, right? We're talking over 50 pages, yeah, something like 70 pages worth of content. So realistically we're not going to be able to get through this in one session we'll maybe do two sessions three sessions we'll go into specific sections of it um, maybe why don't we read uh, section one here text, image captioning, overview, model architectures, pre-training, pre-training, advanced topics. Mm. So one thing that I actually like to do for these type of papers is I like to actually look at just the, the images. I know it sounds kind of like a terrible way to read a paper, but a lot of times you get a lot more information, a lot more bang out of your time if you're just reading or if you just look at the paper the images right because 
Generally, if someone takes the time to make an image out of a concept or an idea, the idea is worth learning, and then also the images transfer more information per unit time than text. So, uh, here you have kind of generic introduction paragraph here. Uh, humans perceive uh, eyes and voice and humans can naturally align and fuse information collected from multiple channels in order to grasp the key concepts. Yeah. I think that's kind of one of the main arguments for multimodality is that humans are also very multimodal. We have a lot of different sensory organs and we use them in combination in order to get a better world model. Popular research area that sits in the nexus of computer vision and natural language processing. Okay, that's what they're calling vision and language, kind of the overlap of these two. Um, they mentioned BERT and uh, Roberta and GPT-3, different big language models. Yeah, and vision language pre-training, VLP, is specifically uh, about learning a representation and embedding space that's common to both of the both the text and the image right so really what you want to learn here is a universal transferable visual and vision language representation so here they point out a couple other survey papers on this task on this and this really kind of shows you the velocity of research in this field that you have a survey paper in 2020 2022 you have here you have at least four different survey papers not including this one for all in 2022 so you almost can't make survey papers fast enough. Okay, so they summarize kind of the applications. This, this, these three bullet points are the uh, contributions of the paper. So, first of all, comprehensive survey. Uh, in-depth discussions and picturing the landscape so it's really all just uh, collecting stuff and kind of meta-analysis and high-level ideas based around all the different research papers that they've done here so again in survey papers there isn't any kind of novel algorithm or uh, research contribution in that dimension the contribution is more in collecting all this all the different papers that people have written over the past couple of years and kind of trying to string a thread through them and see if there's any common themes maybe it allows uh, people that read this to then kind of extrapolate and figure out what's important and what's worth researching in 2023 2024 and so on uh, this paper is based on a tutorial. Oh, interesting. Let's see what that is. Recent advances in vision and language pre-training in conjunction with CVPR. Uh, this is in New Orleans. Um, uh, this is a bunch of people from Microsoft and a, one guy from uh, Facebook. I think this is uh, Chagan is the guy from this paper. Yeah, Gan et al. 2022. So this is the basically let's see previous tutorials organizers program. Okay. The 
primary audience is researchers in computer vision and NLP communities. Okay. So they have this uh, tree here, this tree data structure in which they break down different, uh, I guess, families or sub subfields of vision language pre-training. They have early vision language models. Uh, I think this little sign here is chapter, so that's chapter two. This is chapter three, uh, chapter four, and chapter five. So in chapter two, they're gonna look at some 2015 papers, visual question answering, show and tell, with what they call simple fusion, then maybe attention-based. Uh, right, the original Viswami attention paper is, or transformer paper is 2017, I wanna say. So it looks like basically you have kind of some pre-transformer types of attention, or maybe they were using transformers, they just uh, didn't necessarily, haven't necessarily gotten credit to it, but 2016, I think that's before that transformer paper, and then you have kind of the 2019 paper, once you actually add transformers, you have bilinear pooling, 2016-2017, neural module networks, 2016-2021. So just at a high level, I think that the field of AI research moves so quickly that you actually don't really want to be reading these type of papers. 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, like the architectures and a lot of the kind of intuition you'll build by reading these type of papers isn't necessarily going to be the same dynamics that are in play in 2022. So kind of what I learned from this image here is that we shouldn't necessarily be reading chapter two. Maybe chapter three is really the, the one to start with here, right? Um, we have architecture, dual encoder architectures, such as clip and align, fusion encoders, right, either two-stage or end-to-end. -end. These are much more recent papers here, 2021, 2019, uh, and then some advanced topics. So we have big models, few-shot learning, unified modeling, robust knowledge, blah, blah, blah. So this sounds more interesting to me. So maybe we'll start with chapter one, which is kind of the intro that we're reading now, and then we'll go to chapter three. Uh, maybe we get to chapter four and chapter five, uh, maybe tomorrow or later this week. So image classification, object detection, segmentation, CV in the wild. Yeah, these are much more recent papers here, 21, 22. And then video text, similar to the image text, you have kind of breakdown by architecture the same dual encoder, fusion encoder, two-stage, end-to-end, -end, and then some of the advanced topics. Cool. Yeah, so chapter one is the landscape and a historical view on the transition. Chapter two is kind of these older models and maybe try to kind of paint the picture of how the current state of the art was developed and why people do things in a specific way now. Chapter three is really the, what are people actually doing now for things like image text, image captioning, and so on. Chapter four is for core computer vision and chapter five is for video. Chapter six is a little bit about real world systems and how those work and then chapter seven concludes the paper. Okay, different readers, each chapter is mostly self-contained. If you have a clear goal and a clear research direction, just jump to the corresponding chapter, okay. Okay, so I think here they're going to present the actual tasks that fall within the vision and language field. 
Uh, so image text, again, things such as image text retrieval, image captioning, visual question answering, Okay, so here image text is in this kind of peach color, and then vision tasks as VL problems in this kind of red color, and then video text tasks in this uh, green color. So here we have a picture of a dog, and there's a couple frames on top of each other representing probably a video. So you can think of this as a video of this dog. Right, so they have this little axis here. You have height and width, right? You have each images are 2D, they have a height and a width, and then you have the dimension of time going into the page there. So that's what these individual frames are, they're images over time. So image text tasks, you might have uh, visual question answering, where you have a question, what is the dog holding with its paws? And then given the image and this question, the uh, model is trying to answer, right? And the answer here would be, uh, text, so frisbee. Um, query, a dog is lying on the grass next to a frisbee. Text to image retrieval. So I think in this cast, in this class, or in this task, sorry, you would maybe uh, try to find an image within a database of images that most closely matches the uh, query which again is given in text. And then image captioning is taking the image and then uh, outputting text that uh, describes the image, right? So image to text is all about uh, kind of going from text to image or from image to text or from text to image to text. So that's this uh, peach colored. The red color here is what they call vision tasks. And uh, this is probably what uh, most of you are used to if you come from a computer vision background. This is your basic detection, which is uh, also known as bounding box, where you are trying to find a region or a box within the image that uh, contains a uh, specific thing such as the dog or the grass or the frisbee. Um, segmentation takes that same detection objective and kind of makes it a little bit more difficult um, rather than just predicting uh, a box which is something which is just kind of like a, a height and a width and then a placement so four numbers here in segmentation you're actually going pixel by pixel so you have a, a mask, right? You're masking out everything that is the dog and everything that is grass, and it's a much more difficult problem because, right, it's it's a lot more difficult, right? Look at the boundaries here between the tail and the, and the dog and the ground and so on. And classification is kind of the easiest computer vision task, which is saying, hey, just take this entire image as is, and then uh, classify it into one of uh, a predetermined set of categories. And image classification and image captioning are actually very similar, right? I would say that classification is the easiest, but I think more and more captioning will s supersede classification, right? I think the days of classification are kind of going away just because it's too easy and it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really solve uh, a, a task that humans want. All right, and then finally we have the video text tasks in uh, green here. And this is things like text to video retrieval. So same as text to image, but you have a database of videos and you might have uh, a text that requires a kind of temporal knowledge. So for example, a dog's lying on the grass next to a frisbee, except now you also add while shaking its tail, right? And that extra little phrase there at the end actually makes this problem a lot more difficult because now the model needs to have some knowledge of 
uh, the dog over time and what is the tail and is the tail shaking, is the tail not shaking over time? So that's a much more difficult question. And video question answering, basically the same as uh, image question answering. And video captioning. So the video, ta video text and image text Basically, these are the same tasks, except the video ones are harder, and you're doing them on a series of images over time, right? There's an extra dimension as opposed to just the images themselves. Um, okay, here they just uh, list a bunch of papers. Maybe it's the original papers, to be honest, but I doubt it. I think there's probably older papers that tackle these type of questions. Yeah, so why do they have these pure computer vision tasks in a vision language paper? Well, I think this is an important point here, is that researchers have realized that language supervision can play an important role in computer vision tasks. Yeah, the use of noisy te image text data crawled from the web allows large scale pre chaining of vision. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the big arguments for multimodality is that it's not just about using a multimodal data set for a multimodal task such as the ones we described but the multimodal data set even if you use it for uh, a task that is limited to only one of the modalities of that data set the features that you're going to get are actually going to be richer and better than the features if you just trained on a, on the single modality. So uh, we've seen this before with, for example, depth, where if you have a data set that has RGB and then also has a depth channel, the depth channel is worth using uh, when you pre-train the encoders and when you learn this uh, embedding space, even if you're not going to use that depth later. So kind of the throw everything at it approach to training these uh, models. Yeah, and then kind of the difficult part of video stuff is what we were talking here. The not only capture spatial information, but also capture the inherent temporal dependencies. That's kind of the super hard part. I think to me, video is still difficult because it's just so much more information, right? Uh, you have so many more frames. Like the, the input is just higher dimensional, and there's so much more information there that it kind of feels like the the model architectures that we have now can't necessarily deal with it super well and we're waiting for an order of magnitude kind of uh, improvement in terms of model size and I don't know it just still seems like we're using image based things for videos not necessarily video things All right here in this figure we have a uh, kind of progression of the different models. Um, uh, here we, the task here is visual question answering task. So there's some specific benchmark here, VQAV2 test uh, accuracy. So right, this is accuracy, it's going to be from 0 to 100. So we start here in 2017. Um, BUTD is getting a kind of test accuracy on VQAV2 of around 66 and then if you jump all the way to 2022 on that same task our models are now getting um, over 80 so you do see this progress over time and then I, this color represents kind of a breakdown of, of kind of why these improvements have happened here. And you see that in 2017, 2018, really the models were small scale task specific methods. 
and then we moved to medium scale pre-training and then finally in 2021 2022 we've kind of entered the era of large scale pre-training so huge data sets um, on the biggest possible model trained for the longest amount of time and it kind of makes you think what if you extrapolate this plot right and you look at it uh, we're now in 2025 when we look back right what is this plot going to look like and what is going to be the new color right like what is the the difference and I think sometimes people don't think about that too much and I'm actually concerned about that because I don't think we have right going from small scale to medium scale to large scale all we did was we just started training on bigger data sets for longer with bigger models but I think we're going to run out of the big data sets I think we're already kind of training on the entire internet and if you're training on the entire internet where are you going to get more data right how are you going to 10x the amount of data if you're already training on the entire internet so I think we're going to run out of data before we run out of compute okay Here they're basically just talking about the transitions here. Yeah, no, this is the noisy image text pairs crawled from the web. And we have witnessed a boom of big functional, big multimodal foundation models. Okay, so this is an interesting little section here. They say, what are we actually trying to do here? So what is the North Star that we are pursuing at a community? If, if we could just summon a magic genie and ask them what we want, what what is it that we actually want? And we want a uh, vision, vision language pre-training model, right? So a large model that is has a capability to input and output both vision and language or some combination we want this model to achieve good performance on a range of downstream tasks the problem types are broad there is a broad coverage of data sets that represent different use cases and we also want it to adapt to new tasks with minimal cost Yeah, so they're saying you can measure the adaptation cost uh, by looking at the inference speed, the GPU usage, and the number of training samples. Um, so if you have a large uh, foundational model and then you fine tune it for a specific task, how much effort are you putting into that fine tuning? Right? And you want there to be minimal effort in fine tuning to get good performance on a new task. Maybe they call for a central benchmark, but I would kind of agree with um, an argument Uh, that the Keras guy says, Francois Chalet, that at this point, the benchmarks you want should actually be a, a suite of different tasks rather than a single task. And you should be evaluating models on their ability to perform a variety of tasks.
All right, so they have a bunch of tutorial. This is interesting. They have YouTube links. For image captioning. Wow, that's actually pretty good. Thumbs up. That's pretty good. It's a lot of YouTube videos, lots of stuff here. All right. So chapter two is the one that we decided we kind of want to skip. I think let's do something here that a little bit of a veteran move. Let's actually move to um, chapter six and chapter seven. So these are the high level chapters. So we'll move, we'll go back to the specific chapters that discuss the architecture and then specific sub problems within each of the tasks. But let's kind of get the high level read from this paper first. So, so the technology of vision language learning advances rapidly. More and more companies are integrating VL capabilities into their products and services. Okay, so they're saying uh, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Google all have kind of image captioning in there um, and there are different products already that um, use this type of technology. So it's already outside of the research lab and it's being used in products. Limited review to summarizing published material. Okay, so in Microsoft PowerPoint or in within the Microsoft Suite, you can right click on an image and a drop down menu will appear. If you hit view alt text, a dialog window will appear and it will call the image captioning API of Microsoft Cognitive Service and display the image captioning result. Okay, so you're starting to see here kind of the what the future of this type of uh, technology looks like and it's basically these uh, models being hosted by large companies and put behind an API and then any program can call this API and receive an answer. Uh. I'm uh, drinking some espresso coffee here. And then we chase it with some water. Okay. Microsoft Edge, so another Microsoft product. The image description is read out uh, to use this feature. Okay, blah, blah, blah. It's probably also using the API, the Microsoft Cognitive Services API. Google Chrome allows users to obtain image descriptions, blah, blah, blah. Also, probably through uh, an API. Um, iPhone App Store. Yep, also through an API. Uh, the reason I keep pointing out that it's through an API is that there's a very big distinction between uh, are you running this model on Edge or on the actual device or are you calling a service which has the model already loaded on some cloud computer with a specific GPU that's probably much larger than your phone that's actually doing the task. And there's kind of uh, a back and forth within kind of the, the community and within kind of the 
these companies about uh, what does the future look like? Do you have kind of big models in the cloud that are uh, behind an API that everyone can call in? Like different devices can go and send that service a, an image and then ask for text or send it text and ask for an image? Or are we going to move into a world where the uh, chip in your phone gets better and better and better and better to the point that you don't actually need to have an internet connection and call a model in the cloud, you're performing that model inference directly on the uh, hardware, directly on the edge. And this type of stuff, like image captioning, it makes sense to put it in a, uh, use this uh, 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 API type approach because you're only doing one inference, right? You're sending an image, performing one inference step, and then getting an answer. So it doesn't make sense to load a model onto your device memory and go through that entire process just to perform one step of inference. But if you were, uh, if you had some uh, camera in an industrial application that was constantly performing inference, right? It maybe is running a detector and it's detecting uh, some specific, uh, I don't know, defect within a manufacturing line you want that to run on the device because it needs to constantly perform inference and if it had to constantly send the image to a model service and then get receive the answer back you would it would take be too slow okay they're kind of shilling seeing ai here let's actually check these guys out Seeing AI is an artificial intelligence application developed by Microsoft for iOS. Hmm. This seems interesting to me, right? Why is Why is Microsoft developing this type of software specifically for iPhones, right? You would think that Apple itself would have the ability to, to kind of create this product for its own phone and then would want people to use its own product. So not 100% sure what's going on there, right? Because all of these companies, right, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Google, like they they eventually want people to use their services and they kind of have this like kind of walled garden type mentality so it would make sense that they wouldn't want Microsoft to kind of inject itself into this product and say hey if people want to do something with a vision language model we want people to use our Apple vision language model not Microsoft's Apple not Microsoft's vision language model that runs on their cloud and they get money for right Uh, Google Cloud Vision. Yep, this is the Vision API. Offers powerful pre-trained machine learning models through REST and RPC APIs. Yep. Auto ML Vision, so this is kind of an offering that Google has that allows you to upload images and train custom image models with Auto ML's vision, easy to use graphical interface, optimize your models for accuracy, latency, and size, and then export them to your application in the cloud or to an array of devices at the edge. And then Amazon has kind of the same thing as well they call it recognition. Uh, Pre-trained and customizable computer vision capabilities. And the AI service includes key features such as content moderation, face compare and search, face detection. Celebrity recognition. This is what people care about. <laughs> uh, 
And of course, Alibaba. You know, China also has their own offerings here. Alibaba Cloud Image Search. User to search by image based on image similarities. Uh, search by general purpose image. Yeah, this is a good point here. So how are big foundation models changing the industry? So beside the fact that big foundation models demonstrate superior performance on a variety of downstream vision and vision language tasks, more importantly, they also fundamentally changing the way the industry collects data, develop models, deliver services, and builds their R&D organizations, right? So as we move away from this world where we have kind of this zoo of different small models that are all trained on task specific data sets and are only work within that one task, which is where we were in 2017, 2018, 2019. Now in 21, 2021 and 2022, we're in a world where you have a large pre-trained uh, foundation model that can be fine tuned to a bunch of different tasks. So you've taken what was a bunch of smaller models that are task specific and may and convert it into in into one giant big model that is then used for all the different applications. It's just fine tuned for those specific applications. So this centralization of kind of the models, if you want to think of it that way, means that organizations are now rather rather than saying hey we have these different research groups that are focused on different tasks and they all all work differently you kind of have everyone working towards the same big foundation model and saying we want to basically train this on every single type of data let's put all of our data in such of a format that we can use it to train this big foundation model so and that's also a lot easier to monetize once you have one big model it's also uh, more of a competitive moat, right? It's very difficult for a smaller company or especially a startup to get the type of data and have the type of money required to train this large model. So I think you're seeing the centralization of uh, machine learning with these big foundation models. Okay, there are also many factors that one has to consider when deploying a vision language model to real world applications, including robustness to a new domains. This is kind of the, the big one. Um, inference cost and latency, fairness and responsible AI. Um, I would say inference cost is really determined by uh, your application, kind of like how big is the edge computer that you're using and how much are you willing to pay for an API if you want to go that strategy. Robustness to new domains is a little bit outside of your control. Um, that depends on kind of how often are you uh, retraining on and refine tuning on uh, an updated data set. How much does your uh, domain change over time, right? So if someone's working in an agriculture scenario and they have a model that's working really well in the summer and they've collected a bunch more data about the summer, come winter time, that model's not going to work very well anymore because the, the lighting is going to be different. There might be snow and so on. So you're going to need to recollect that data set and so on. So keeping your model up to date and, and, shifting the domain upon which your model is fine-tuned as the real world also shifts and keeping those domains over top each other is important. Uh, fairness and responsible AI issues are kind of the fuzziest and hardest to deal with, to be honest, because it's very difficult to force people to do, uh, to use tools in the way that isn't uh, evil if you if you want to think of it like that, right? People, there's plenty of companies that make guns and 
people shoot people with those guns, so I don't know. I don't think that's a problem that's going to be solved by the AI community anytime soon. As more and more applications start to deploy VL models, we expect the demand for solutions to these practical issues to become increasingly strong. Images in real-world scenarios are usually unpredictable and have large variations, and the model must be robust. Yeah, I like this little summary. Though there has been a lot of work on domain adaptation in other computer vision areas, there has been little research on domain adaptation for VL models. I mean, I would put this differently. I would say that uh, domain adaptation was much more important when you had small computer vision models trained on small task-specific data sets that usually had a very small variance uh, on the training data set. But these large foundational models, uh, especially the ones that are trained on image captioning, image captioned like the entire internet, the variance on that domain is so huge, right? Because you have everything from pictures of cats to pictures of cars. Like, there's such a huge variance in the training data set that domain adaptation is not that big of a deal anymore. Uh, okay, they found at least one example here. They say that, hey, there's a lot of pictures of diagrams, tables, and charts that don't exist. So, sure. But I think what might be interesting is that all of this uh, work and all of the thought and all of the kind of time that people have spent thinking about domain adaptation and how to improve it, how to make models more robust, might just disappear. And it might be something that we just kind of solve with scale. And as we get these bigger and bigger data sets that are more and more uh, varied, have a wider and wider kind of variance in terms of the types of images, the size of images, the cameras used and everything, the lighting, it all will kind of disappear and domain adaptation will no longer become an issue because everything is automatically kind of works well in all domains. Serving cost, okay. Reducing model size without sacrificing accuracy. So I think there's a ton of good work on that, right? Um, Quantization of models, sparsity of models. There's a lot of ways to take a big model and make it much smaller uh, from a compute footprint. Yeah, so here they're talking about uh, a small vision language model called Mini VLM that reduces the model size by 73% and the inference cost by 94%. Uh, knowledge distillation to compress transform based uh, lottery ticket hypothesis so this is an interesting this is uh, I've actually talked to this guy who wrote this paper but he basically posits this hypothesis that within a uh, trained model you can remove a bunch of the weights like a huge like 90 percent of those numbers zero them out and the model will still perform great right and it's not easy to figure out what subset of those weights and those model parameters you need but uh in this paper he presented a couple examples of where he did that and he said hey look at this i was able to reduce this model size by like 90 percent and it still had the same accuracy so a bunch of these weights inside these models are actually not necessarily doing much they're just kind of like noise so he said that this might be the case for all models and you might be able to take gpt3 zero out 90 percent of those numbers and you still get the same accuracy on benchmarks so um yeah, he calls these lottery tickets, these like tiny models, or these subsets of the weights inside a model that still perform just as well. Um, so here they're saying 50 to 70% sparsity. So 
if you have a model with 5 billion parameters, you uh, reduce it by 50%. So it only has 2.5 billion parameters and still has the same amount of accuracy, or at least 99% of it, which is pretty cool. It means that we can probably reduce the size of our models drastically and still have the same performance. All right, biases, blah, blah, blah. Data sets are generally skewed towards lighter skinned males. Uh, yeah, I don't know, I think that it's a red, her red herring to be honest. I think the world is biased and you can't undo that bias. You just got to make the world less biased and then your AI will become less biased. If you try to make the AI less biased without making the world less biased, you're you're not going to get anywhere. Okay, in this chapter we provide a concise summary of what has been reviewed and discuss the current research trends. So, paper surveys, the most recent advances at the frontier of VLP research, including VLP for image gen, VLP for core vision, and VLP for video text. Before the era of pre-training. We have introduced how the field has been moving from intermodality attention design, which aims to capture the multimodal alignment and perform multimodal fusion, to intramodality attention design, which it aims to capture visual relation among image regions via graph attention networks. Two, three, the convergence to the transformer architecture, which models both inter and intramodality interactions. So, uh, Intermodality, so between two different modalities. So it's trying to say, hey, we have um, some image features, we have some text features. How can we uh, design an attention mechanism that, that kind of connects the right parts together, right? Connects the features that are relevant to the image and relevant to the some specific text. Make the attention of those work out more. Vocabulary is terrible this morning, I apologize. Intramodality, which is basically within individ within a specific modality, right? So uh, specific regions within the image paying attention to each other. And then he says that basically now, or they say now that the convergence to the transformer architecture, right? Transformers uh, coming from that attention is all you need, where basically everything pays attention to everything else, uh, especially if you have uh, the image and the text all being fed into one common uh, representation, one common embedding, and then that embedding is basically through the transformer architecture paying attention to itself, so any part of the text can pay attention to any part of the image or any part of itself, and so on. And it does seem like the transformer architecture is kind of here to stay, and it's taking over, so it makes sense that it's kind of solved uh, this, uh, it's solved the problem of human design of attention mechanisms, right? You don't need to have these different design mechanisms anymore. The transform architecture has its own attention mechanism that works great for everything. VLP for image text. We've covered VLP models for image captioning, visual question answering. OD based VLP models, which requires extraction of image regional features first from an offline pre trained object detector. So, this is, I guess, object detection based VLP models to the prevailing end to end VLP models, partially. Okay. 
Early VLP models are only pre-trained on approximately 4 million images with roughly 10 million image text pairs. Okay, so I think this is one of those data sets where it's only 4 million images, but then there's a bunch of bounding boxes within each image, and each bounding box has a specific uh, caption. So that's why you have more image text pairs than the uh, number of images in the data set. While the most recent big VLP models are already pre-trained on over 10 billion image text pairs. So 10x, more than that difference. And I think this is what I was talking about before, where we were able to go from 10 million to 10 billion because we were training on something like Coco to training on something like the whole internet. But I don't know if we have uh, something, I don't know how we're going to go from 10 billion to 10 trillion. Right, like where are we getting these these images? There, there, there's like no more images to, to have, right? And maybe we have to synthetically create those, right? Maybe we synthetically create data sets and then that's how we create data sets that are large enough to train on to get a performance improvement. But to me, that's one of the kind of questions to be answered as we move in the future. All right, VLP for core vision tasks. What is computer vision in the reading, in the wild readings? What if we just search for computer vision in the wild? GitHub, computer vision in the wild. Okay, so I think these are, what is computer vision in the wild? A collection of papers on the topic computer vision in the wild. Okay, so this is the same uh, Microsoft researchers that um, wrote this paper, and then this is kind of just a collection of their papers. Cool. So, language augmented visual models demonstrate a strong zero shot transfer capability since they acquire open set and open vocabulary recognition capabilities through problem reformulation. Yeah, so. This is uh, what we were talking about before, how even just for core vision tasks, the introducing language as a pre-training task, right? You can have these auxiliary losses when you're training a classifier or a detector to uh, also try to do things like image retrieval or phrase grounding or captioning and uh, model generalization will be improved as natural language supervision typically contains much richer semantics. Right. Finally, text VLP for video text tasks. We observed the same research trend as that of image text, a transition from the use of offline extracted video features to end-to-end -end VLP models, uh, use of video transformers. Yeah, so what do they mean by offline extracted video features? So rather than taking a video and then feeding each image into a pre-trained covnet, getting a feature vector, and then treating a video as a series of feature vectors upon which you will do classification or something like that, going directly end to end, right? Having the model that actually does the classification or the captioning or whatever you actually want to solve the final task go from image space directly to the final answer, right? Don't use this kind of intermediate offline feature vector. Learning from multi-channel videos, adaptation of image text models for video text tasks, okay, and blah, blah, blah.
and then finally text to image generation. I don't know why this one doesn't have a bullet point, but VQ token based auto regressive methods such as Dolly. That little Dolly reference there. Party Dolly two, right? Which is diffusion. How to build general purpose multimodal foundation model. Yeah, that's kind of the holy grail, right? We aim to build one foundation model that is scalable and generalizable. It can be readily adopted to various downstream tasks. Ranging from image level vision tasks, such as classification, retrieval, and captioning, where you have the entire image and you want uh, some answer related to that whole image. Region level vision tasks where you want some subset of that image such as bounding box detection or phrase grounding. And then pixel level where you want to actually know what each individual pixel in the image uh, whether it belongs to a certain class or uh, they say image generation is a pixel level vision task. I suppose because you have to decide which every, which, what every pixel in the image represents. This also aligns with the grand vision of building a single generalist agent, uh, such as the Gatto paper out of DeepMind, that can perform a wide range of tasks with a single set of model weights. We need a unified model architecture that can be readily scaled up and when being pre-trained at scale, it can be readily adapted to various downstream computer vision and vision language tasks. I would say we already have this. We already have the unified model architecture. It's called transformers. Uh, we almost have the pre-training at scale. I think we just need to get all of our, every single image that was ever created, like put every single data set into one format that you can use to train the same model. It's gonna be a bunch of different model heads probably with a bunch of different tasks. You're gonna have a lot of different hyperparameters for this massive loss function that's gonna have like 50 terms on it. But I think that's where we need to go. Meta LM shows that language models can have a general purpose interface for many diverse tasks. Okay. We envision that more research efforts will be devoted to unified modeling. Yeah, the unification of computer vision and visual language tasks is possible. This also requires better benchmarks for the evaluation of the performance of such computer vision foundation models. This is maybe their cry for the benchmark. Uh, zero shot generalization, right? So maybe this is more akin to what I was saying, which is, hey, you have a bunch of different benchmarks and then evaluate this model, how it performs for each of those benchmarks. Training large transformers from massing amounts of text data. Great success. This was a great success, not just for uh, scale, but also for transformers. And I would say that 
the prevalence of transformers as kind of the unified architecture for all machine learning is because of their great performance in uh, text and the way that they scale very nicely. Compared with the scale of language models, the scaling for VLP models is still in its infant stage. We envision that bigger VL models, especially open source ones, will appear in the future. It would also be interesting to investigate the emergent abilities of such big models once they become available. So this is actually super interesting where the the vision language stuff that you see now is actually not hasn't had the kind of emergent breakthrough that uh, text-based models have. So text being kind of an easier modality to collect and train on, uh, we got to the uh, kind of scale part quicker. So when it comes to text models, we're already kind of operating at a much larger scale and thus uh, in terms of the data set and the training time and the total training uh, or and the model size as opposed to we're at a bigger scale there so GPT-3 and those type of things the, the text models are further along in development than the image models so that's an interesting thing to think about that what are the emergent capabilities of image models going to look like Maybe that's what stable diffusion is, right? Okay, can we train a model that can quickly adapt to different downstream tasks with only a few context examples? So Flamingo does this for question answering, captioning, and classification. Efficient adaptation. Yeah, size of VL models are getting big. Images are just kind of bigger in general, right? Especially models that have to use video. Video is even more. Uh, there's a huge difference between uh, an image and a video, right? The video is significantly larger, much more inference is required, much more compute is required to even deal with that. Big foundation models encapsulate abundant multimodal knowledge. Well, various types of knowledge are evolving. One solution is to enhance pre-trained models using external knowledge. Uh, knowledge enhance NLP models, also called retrieval augmented methods. So I don't, I don't quite agree with the knowledge enhanced and the retrieval stuff because basically you have a model that knows how to search and kind of an external database of knowledge. I think this is an attempt by kind of the people in the expert systems field, right? There's kind of a, this cohort of older researchers that in the 90s and 2000s, right, they, they were building what they called expert systems, which were basically, you could think of it like uh, you have a database of knowledge, you have some kind of uh, state machine graph, and you go through this graph and you can answer questions, but it's all kind of hard-coded, engineered, uh, by humans and um, they still want to keep going back to that right there's a lot of people who still think that you're not going to be able to have these giant end-to-end -end deep learning systems that work the best and that you're going to have these like hard-coded human designed like kind of state machines and, and systems that we have all these boxes that have arrows going to all these other things and all these different subparts. and I think that's just complication and over-engineering, and I think that we don't, 
I think that's a waste of time. I think you're better off just trying to figure out how to make these models bigger and get bigger data sets. Robustness, validate models on the standard and well-established benchmarks. Okay. Image net classification, COCO object detection, and VQA V2. I would say image net classification and COCO object detection are very old at this point, and we need to get way better. Okay. Concluding remarks. The aforementioned research directions are deeply connected to achieve the same goal of developing a general purpose multi sense AI system. So, right, you could actually say that the first AGI is actually going to come out of this branch here. It's going to be a very large vision language uh, foundation model. That's probably going to be the first AGI. There are some people that think that the big language models are already kind of an AGI, right? There's that whole sentient argument. But I think that the combination of vision and language is much more powerful than language by itself. Yeah, when the model is significantly scaled up, the capability of in-context few shot lurching may emerge naturally. So <laughs> low key they're saying we're gonna get AGI from this. Uh, we need to improve robustness and cost efficiency. Ironic observation that it is impossible for our writing to catch up with a daily updated research innovation. Yeah, the research field just moves so quick. Cool, so they have their acknowledgement and then uh, bibliography for these survey papers is also fun to look at because it's hundreds that hundreds of papers here okay so we read uh, chapter one and then chapter seven or six and seven yep uh, so now let's take a quick break and then we'll go back to uh, maybe image text tasks I think this is a good starting point so let's go here we will return
All right, and we're back. Um, okay, so now we're going to be looking at chapter three of this uh, summary paper or survey paper. And this paper goes into kind of details on VLP for image text tasks. Um, okay, so they kind of list out uh, the different tasks here. You have VQA, visual question answering, uh, image captioning, and image text retrieval. You say these are the three most widely studied image text tasks. Uh, the unification of architectures in NLP and computer vision. Right, they're talking about transformers. Large amounts of image caption pairs are fed into a model that consumes both images and text to pre-train representations that encode rich multimodal knowledge. So, you know, a systematic overview of new emerging training paradigm. A couple sections. Okay. Overview of VLP models. They broadly divide VLP methods into two categories, dual encoder and fusion encoder. Okay, so in dual encoder, you have images and text are encoded separately. So I'm sure there'll be a uh, picture of this, but basically the image gets fed into a network that only takes the image and outputs a feature vector and then the text gets put into a network that only takes the text and outputs a feature vector. And then those feature vectors are combined and then fed into some model head or some other downstream task. So the text and the images are getting encoded separately, right? You're going from image to a vector and from text to a vector separately. This model architecture is effective for image retrieval tasks and when scaled up can be used to learn a strong image encoder from scratch via large constructive large scale contrastive pre-training which is what clip does so contrastive learning is basically uh, when you so when you you have an image and it converts it into a vector and then you have another image and it converts it into a vector you can take those vectors and you can say during training, I you can tell your model, I want these vectors to be closer together or further apart, right? And you're basically pushing and pulling points together in this embedding space. And if you do that over a huge data set, right, you're going to end up with an embedding space where images that are similar result in vectors that are close together and images that are different result in vectors that are far apart, right? And the reason people like these type of uh, training objectives is that they're unsupervised, right? You don't necessarily need to have a bunch of bounding boxes with labels or pixel perfect segmentation masks to do so. You can just kind of uh, have a loosely labeled data set where you say maybe these images are the same, these images are different, and so on. Uh, Clip actually performs poorly on VQA. Okay, good to know. Okay, so these are a dual encoder where images and text are encoded separately. And then they say that a uh, whole other branch is what they call fusion encoder, which, which is uh, transformer layers are typically used, typically employed to model the deep interaction between image and text representations. So Fusion Encoder achieves superior performance on VQA and image captioning, but can be very ineffective when applied to image retrieval as it requires to encode all the possible image text pairs to compute similarity scores for ranking. Okay, so basically when you're feeding both the image and the text into the model, 
uh, for some specific tasks, that's actually not great because you might only have the image or you might only have the text, right? So in an image retrieval, you only have the text and you want to get the image. So it can become a lot more costly if you have to feed both image and text into the model. And they say there's some work here that uses both. So here they have a big table, um, papers all the way from 2019 to 2022. They have the encoder that they use for the vision. So here, for example, VIL BERT is trained uh, with an object detection encoder plus a Xformer transformer. I don't know if that's actually transformer or just Xformer. Okay, actually, yeah, here you go. O OD equals object detector. Xformer is a transformer. EMB is embedding. MLM, MIM is masked language and image modeling. ITM is image text matching. And ITC, image text contrastive learning. So this is the unsupervised stuff. Ooh. WRA, word region alignment. This is some kind of text uh, training law or training task token prediction this is usually what people do for uh, is how GPT-3 was trained right predicting the next token in a sequence CA contrastive alignment another kind of contrastive learning loss GC grounding and captioning and Dagger. In many cases, e.g. Flamingo, the multimodal fusion model itself is also directly called or serves as the text decoder. So, they have, yeah. okay, so you have different vision encoders. You have object detection, CNNs, patch embeddings, uh, the vision transformers. Sometimes they're doing this like stuff with patches. Um, text encoders, right? How is the fusion happening? So co-attention versus merged attention, right? Cross attention. Um, there's no fusion happening here. So, ooh. so for example, this is what they were saying. Clip is a dual encoder, right? You have a CNN encoding the image, transformer encoding the text, and then there's no fusion of the modalities. Uh, check for decoder, X for no decoder, and then all the different objectives. So this one here, for example, has a train on a bunch of different losses, but yeah, this is kind of a large, confusing <laughs> table exhaustive but that's this is kind of what survey papers are all about and the amount of work that goes into a table like this right collecting all these papers and then getting all this information and making sure it's right because you know that some of these authors are going to read this and then they're going to argue that their paper does something better than what you're saying here so lots of work to create that kind of table okay Focus on the review of VLP methods for fusion encoder architecture, postponing the detailed discussions of dual encoder models. Among fusion encoder methods, we further divide them into two categories based on whether the models can be pre-trained end-to-end. -end. Early VLP models adopt a two-stage pre-training pipeline where image region features are first extracted from a pre-trained object detector. Okay, more recently, end-to-end pre-training methods uh, became popular where image features are extracted from either convolutional neural networks or transformers, VITs, or only using image patch embeddings. The model gradients can be backpropagated into the vision backbone for end-to-end -end training. 
end-to-end -end VLP methods have achieved new state-of-the-art on all major VL tasks. Yeah, so again, this kind of fuels the rant that I went into earlier where these over-engineered uh, architectures and systems where you have multiple stages of inference with these kind of hard-coded rules and clever uh, organization and merging and concatenation of vectors and feeding them into different models which are trained on different objectives. I think time and time again we see that those over overcomplicated, over-engineered methods always end up losing to these kind of just end-to-end -end big model, big data set, simple architecture. So it actually is great for us too, kind of as members of the deep learning and just kind of machine learning research community, it's, it's good for us, right? If the world, if state of the art meant increasingly complicated models, it would become increasingly difficult to make progress on that. But it just so happens that state of the art is also aligned with the simplification of these models. So it actually gets easier as we get better rather than it getting more complicated as we get better. Early methods used pre-trained object detectors to extract visual features. Yeah, so I'm not even gonna bother reading that because it's not worth it here. Oh, this is kind of a cool little chart here. So, uh, VLP models developed for image text tax tasks a long time. So they have here Facebook AI Research and Georgia Tech with VIL BERT. Right, I would say Clip uh, from OpenAI was definitely a a big point here, and then Flamingo from DeepMind also a big point. But you kind of see the major players here. You see Microsoft, Google, uh, Alibaba, and DeepMind, which is also Google. I would say they're missing the uh, Facebook AI research does a bunch of like unsupervised uh, image stuff that they're not including here maybe because they're biased and they don't want to give Facebook the publicity but I would say Facebook's or Meta Meta's uh, image research stuff is pretty good right and that's uh, Jan LeCun and, and his kind of handiwork. CNN-based grid features. Who cares about CNNs, right? VIT, Vision Transformers. This is what all the cool kids are using now. Right, where you basically take an image, and the way that the VIT paper works is they take an image, break it into patches, and then train it on predicting the next patch. So you kind of treat an image like a sentence, right? Where you're reading the image left to right and feeding those little patches and then using it, uh, using a transformer, the same transformer that you use for language models. So there's a couple different types of transformers. There's a what they call plain VIT and swim transformers. Okay, this is actually kind of cool. They break down Okay, so from 2017 to 2019, uh, you saw a jump of 66 to 71%, and they say 
uh, this is coming from task specific methods so over engineering and but I would say kind of the big one here is the transformer August 2019 to August 2021 this is when you started to see uh, large pre-training and you go from 71 to 78 percent accuracy but even though there's uh, these are similar jumps I think once you get into the higher accuracy percentages it gets harder right each going from 80 to 90 percent is easier than going from 90 to 95 percent for example not necessarily it's going to be it's going to depend on the benchmark but a lot of times that's the case and getting those last couple nines is like basically almost impossible uh, models are scaled up and okay so then August 2021 to 2022 we saw the models get scaled up. Why is this not? I want to close out of that. All right, whatever. Model size and pre-training, and we saw the performance boost. Right, so even though this was a smaller increase than the uh, previous kind of time periods that they have here, it going from 80 to 84 is no joke. Um, okay, this is the chart that we saw earlier. It's actually almost exactly the same chart. Model architectures. Okay, so now they go into different model architectures here. Multimodal fusion, co-attention, merged attention. encoder and encoder decoder this is thick four representative VLP models for image to text tasks pre-training data sets Okay. Given an image text pair, a VL model first extracts text features. Okay, so you have some text features, W, and in some set of W1 to WN, and visual features, V, uh, in some set V1 to VM, where uh, I guess N is the number of tokens in a sentence, and M is the number of visual features in an image. Okay, so in a sentence, for example, uh, this sentence here, given an image and text pair a VL model first extracts, right, you have a token. Usually each word is a token, but sometimes big words are split into multiple tokens and there's special character tokens such as like commas and stuff like that. So you're going to have N tokens for a sentence. And uh, if you fed an image into a confnet, you might just have one feature vector, right? But with the uh, vision transformers usually you split the image into patches and then each patch has a feature associated with it right and that's kind of why they have an m there because you might have yeah which can be the number of image regions grids patches depending on the specific vision encoder used the text and vision features are fed into a multimodal fast fusion model to produce cross modal per representations which are then optionally fed into a decoder before generating the final outputs An illustration of this general framework is shown in Figure 3.3. In many cases, there are no clear boundaries amongst image and text backbones, multimodal fusion models, and the DEER decoder, right? So there's kind of a lot of fuzziness between these, maybe residual connections and, and concatenations and feeding one part into another part and so on. We refer to the part of the model that only takes image and text features as inputs as the corresponding vision and text encoder, but the part of the model that takes both images and text features as the multimodal fusion module. Okay, so this is kind of the terminology they're going to use or to taxonomy, I guess, to, to separate the different parts of the model. So if a model is 
only getting images, then it's going to be a vision encoder. If a model is only getting text, then it's going to be a text encoder. If a model receives both images and text, either of which is already a uh, feature, it, we're going to call that the multimodal fusion module. Uh, beside this, if there are additional modules, uh, we call it that take the multimodal features as input to generate the output, we call it a decoder. Okay, this is kind of overloading the, the term decoder. To me, decoder should kind of be reserved for uh, systems that specifically have an encoder and a decoder, right? Like a uh, auto encoder, right? Uh, but I suppose that anything that goes from an encoded or embedding space, right? Some vector and goes to an output such as text or image, you can call it a decoder. Three types of vision encoders. You have object detector, a uh, convnet, and then a vision transformer. So. We're not going to really look at object detections or CNNs because these are kind of old at this point. And honestly, if you're, if you're trying to get more bang for your buck, just start from transformers. Just forget about convnets, forget about the stuff beforehand. Everything's going to be transformers anyways. Just learn what a transformer is, learn the kind of attention, and then that'll be more useful for you moving forward. Learnable special token. Okay. Yeah, and then there's a couple different variants of the transformer architecture. Uh, swing transformer, clip VIT, and so on. So here's kind of uh, what we were talking about before here. So the part, this is just a bunch of layers, right? Each of these uh, rounded squares represents a, a model, right? Which at the end of the day is just a bunch of... Uh, layers of neural networks arranged in different ways, right? A bunch of matrix multiplications um, with some weights, some biases, some hyperparameters, basically just a, a bunch of uh, parameters that uh, specify a bunch of connected neurons that are trained with gradient descent. So that's kind of the, the general definition of what these little these little rounded cubes are, but there's going to be a huge uh, variety of different architectures even within these types of things. So the, the model that takes the text and outputs a vector is called the text encoder. The model that takes an image and outputs a vector is called the image encoder. Anything that takes both of these is called the multimodal fusion. Um, and then you have the decoder, which takes that and then, or takes the combined vector which is itself also transformed into some different vector and then decodes it into whatever downstream task you want. Okay, they talk about text encoding. Uh, right, a lot of BERT, which is kind of one of the first big text encoders that people kind of used a lot. Uh, Flamingo which is a huge pre-trained language model with 70 billion parameters. And for dual encoders like clip and align, fusion is performed via dot product. There are mainly two types of fusion models, namely merged attention and co-attention. Okay. So co-attention and merged attention. So here we're talking about the multimodal fusion module. So this is the part here that is receiving, right, the image encoder, right? So like basically just a vector that represents this image and then a vector that represents the text. And now you need to think about, okay, how, how am I combining 
those two vectors. So I can feed each of the vectors into their own kind of transformer. And then I simply have uh, these kind of connections here between the text and the text encode, the text vector and the visual vector. Here they say feature, so I'm going to start saying feature instead of vector. So visual feature and text feature, you have basically these connections, and they're calling this co-attention. Merged attention is you take the feature, uh, the visual feature and the text feature, right? So two vectors, and you just simply concatenate them, and then you feed them into a transformer. And as far as the transformer is concerned, they're basically the same. They're, they're, it's just one input, right? And they call this merged attention. So they merge the features together and then perform attention. Uh, yep, text and features are simply concatenated together and then fed into a single transformer block. Co-attention, uh, the text and visual features are fed into different transformer blocks and techniques such as cross-attention are used to enable cross-modal interaction. Merged attention and co-attention models can achieve comparable performance, but the merged attention module is more parameter efficient and as, as the same set of parameters. Yeah, again, we see how more complicated hand-designed systems where we separate things as humans because we think it'll help better end up being worse than merged attention or than just a simple simple version of the system, right? So merged attention module is more parameter efficient than co-attention. So if you have the same set of parameters, right, you had a bigger merged attention module and uh, correspondingly uh, same size co-attention, the merged attention would perform better, right? That's kind of how you can you can think about parameter efficiency. If a, if a smaller model performs better than the bigger model, you're almost always going to want to use the smaller model because it helps you um, in general, right? Like because you you're usually constrained in a real world problem by the the size of your uh, the compute that you're actually going to run it on. Okay. Transformers have now become a universal computation engine. I do agree with that. Advocate the use of a transformer-based encoder-decoder where the cross-modal representations are first fed into a decoder and then to an output layer. The use of an image of an encoder decoder can enable the unification of various image text tasks and zero shot few shot learning of VLP models. Detter is uh, Facebook's work. Oh. <laughs> Figure 3.5. So you have encoder only. You have the image. Uh, you're feeding it the uh, text. This is masked. So uh, in this uh, task, you're asking the model to say, what is this M, right? That's the task. You're saying a dog lying on the blank next to a blank. And the model is tasked with saying glass and frisbee. So a dog lying on the grass next to a frisbee, right? This should actually be grass, not glass. Um, 
dog lying on the grass next to a frisbee and then here they say encoder decoder so what is the s token i don't know The MLM objective is first introduced in language model pre-training. So mass language modeling, this is uh, what, we, what we're seeing here. That's what this M token is. It's the mask. Uh, in MLM, given a image text pair, we randomly mask out the input words with probability 50% and replace the masked ones with a special token. And the goal is to predict these mass tokens based on the surrounding words and the paired image by minimizing the negative log likelihood. So if you're minimizing the negative log likelihood, you're maximizing the log likelihood, which is you're trying to find the word that is hot, that is most likely to be in that masked place, right? You're trying to find the highest likelihood word in your vocabulary of tokens that maximizes that uh, the likelihood which is basically you could be like a probability and log likelihood just shapes the likelihood so that it's uh, nice and bounded and, and simple and the derivatives are nice so that when we have our losses and our gradient descent uh, stuff it's easy to take the derivative of that loss function Right, I think that that's kind of an important point there. So like likelihood versus log likelihood, right? So where's this picture? Here it is. So in this picture, right, you can see that log likelihood looks like this, or likelihood is this orange one, and then log likelihood is this, uh, this blue one. So maximum likelihood occurs when uh, theta equals two and the maximum likelihood estimator is two. So I wonder if they have a good summary of why. Uh, the basic theory, uh, okay, the advantages and disadvantages of maximum likelihood estimation. Let's scroll up if they have a Yeah, in practice, the joint distribution function can be difficult to work with, and the log of the likelihood function is used instead. So this is the whole reason why log likelihood is a thing. It's not that there's something special about the log or something. I guess there is something special about it, but it's, it's to make the math easier, right? The reason people take the log of things like the log likelihood um or they put things through a soft max or any of these kind of transformations is that you're making derivatives easier, right? Because the derivative of a log is very easy, right? It's just one over that. So it's very easy to, to calculate. That's why the log is chosen. Okay, language modeling, prefix LM. Image text matching. Given a batch of matched or mismatched image caption pairs, the model needs to identify which images and captions correspond to each other. Okay, this is a slightly different. Most VLP models treat image text matching as a binary classification. A special token class is appended at the beginning of the input sentence to learn a, clo a glo global cross-modal representation. Yeah, so this is kind of like a unsuper like semi-supervised way of generating semi-supervised training objective by uh, you have a data set that has captions and images and then sometimes you shuffle 
the captions and images and you say, is this caption related to this image or not, right? And you can, as the model gets better and better, you can kind of use negative example mining to get even more difficult examples of those and then train the model of those. Image text contrastive learning. Uh, given a batch of n image text pairs. So a lot of these training setups involve uh, image text data set. Im IGC aims to predict the n matched pairs from all the n squared possible image text pairs. Normalized image vectors and text vectors in a training batch. So there's a batch normalization happening here. We compute the image to text and text to image similarities. Right, so how similar are the vectors, the image vectors to the text vector and the text vector to the image vector? Um, ITC laws can be enhanced for, say, via triple contrastive learning, TCL. Multimodal learnable codebook. So codebook is, uh, sometimes they quantize these the embedding space into specific vectors and then those that allows you to, rather than have a continuous uh, embedding, continuous features, you have kind of like a discretized feature space, and you can look it up in a code book. Okay. Masked image modeling task, where you have a model that is trained to uh, reconstruct masked patches of the image. Okay, let's actually go here to the 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 figure where we're gonna kind of see the best stuff. Let's try to see if we can get one more zoom in here. There we go. Okay, so we have uh, A, B, C, D. We have four sections in this figure. We have four representative VLP models for image text tasks. Okay. We have Uniter, the VILT, ALBEF, ALBEF, and SIMVLM. So in Uniter, it seems like we're masked language modeling. So we have... Uh, patches of an image, right? And then we have a uh, sentence of which some of the words are masked, right? Masked language. Masked region modeling is you have the same thing. You have uh, different patches of an image and then a sentence, except in this part, you're going to patch out. You're going to remove certain parts of the image, some of the, some of those image patches. And the task is to find the image patch that's missing, the masked image patch, or the masked region of the image. So in uh, this part, you're trying to find the masked word. Here, you're trying to find the masked part of the image. And then word region alignment, WRA, and image text matching. So in this case, you're, you have the same thing again, the different patches of the same image you have the sentence associated with that image, and then at the very end, you have a CLS, a class token, and what you're trying to figure out is this class token, and then um, you have kind of here some kind of attention map, so you can see that man has high, or dog, and his dog, man's dog, like different parts of the text and the uh, image correspond, right? So like this, it's very hard to see on your screen, but I can kind of see it. But like this first red image here is a man, 
and the last one here is a dog. So you can see that the word man has a very dark square with the image of the man, which means that this part of the sentence, man, of course, or has a high kind of attention score with the picture of the man, the patch of the image that represents the man. Um, image embedder, so this is taking a region of the image and putting it into an embedding space. So there's an RCNN to actually convert it into a vector, and then there's some kind of uh, location, right? Where within the image is this? A similar thing is kind of happening with this text embedder, where you have a the actual token itself, such as man or dog, and then uh, position, which is kind of where within the sentence is this word, and that gives that feeds through uh, to get you the text feature and the image feature. So that is the unitor model, and then these are getting concatenated. So you have right these image features, and then you simply concatenate them with the text features, and you feed that into a transformer, and this transformer is being trained on these three losses. Okay, so that is section A here. Let's move to section B here. We have vision language transformer, 2020 paper. So you have a similar thing going on here. You have a sentence, and then you have different patches of this image, right? So you have the image here uh, is broken up into six different patches, and then each of those patches is uh, fed into our image embedder or encoder, and you get uh, those image, the different patches, the feature vectors representing each of the little patches of those image, right? And here it says that there is that, that little feature vector that comes out for each word token or for each patch of the image has different parts to it. It has the actual embedding, so this is the actual vector, but then it also has a position embedding, which is maybe right something that represents that this is the top left and this is the bottom right of the image. And then the token embedding, which is token position embedding, which is something that represents where along the lines or where it, within the sentence is this word. Um, and then there's some extra learnable class embedding that's also outputted from this embedding, the text embedder and the image embedder. And then you basically concatenate those and feed them into one transformer. And then it uh, has a couple different tasks here that it's using to push gradients down this entire thing. It's doing image text patching where you're saying this uh, text corresponds to this image, and that's either true or false, right? Not a lot of gradient signal there, but uh, very easy to kind of shuffle your data set and create a huge amount of data that way. Masked language modeling, where you're uh, trying to maybe guess this class token. A stone statue near a mask, or no, 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 you're not trying to get the, guess the class token, you're trying to guess the mask token. So here in the masked language modeling loss that you're feeding through this whole thing, you're uh, trying to figure out what this mask token is. And in this case here, it's office, right? A stone statue near an office. And then word patch alignment in which you're taking individual patches and uh, aligning them to individual words. So uh, maybe they have bounding boxes or something, but you're trying to get, uh, for example, the, the token statue, the word statue, to kind of pay more attention to the part of the, the image patch that has the statue in it. Um, so that's this picture here, B, V-I-L-T. All right, let's go to section C here. Uh, this is A-L-B-E-F. This is a 2021 paper. All right, we have a similar situation going on here. You have image and you have text being fed into two separate encoders. You have an image encoder and then you have a text encoder. Uh, interestingly here, the uh, image encoder is a transformer and the text encoder is also a transformer. Right, you see these self-attention blocks here. That means that it's a transformer, it's not a CNN. 
um, then you take the uh, vectors of the image and the vectors uh, for the text and you do image text contrastive loss so what that means is that you're you're saying images that are the same should have the same vectors here text images and text that correspond should have the same should have similar more similar vectors vectors that are closer and images and text that do not correspond should have vectors that are further away um, and then you feed both the image and the text vectors into a multimodal encoder which takes out takes both of those I think in this case the fact that the image vector is going into this cross attention means that uh, this is one of the co-attention mechanisms right where there is a there's separate kind of transformer blocks for text and vision but they're kind of they pay attention to each other they pay attention to each other so it's not uh, like these first two here like A and B where the uh, image and the text embeddings are concatenated and then uh, you're using uh, masked language modeling and a image text matching losses to, to train these so there's a couple different uh, training tasks and losses being kind of fed into this system. You have ITM, MLM, and then the uh, contrastive loss. Momentum update, momentum distillation. I don't quite know what that means. Maybe they're referring to some kind of momentum within the gradient updates. I don't know. And finally, D, sim VLM. Uh, we have, again, an image being broken up into patches. Those patches, in this case, going through a convolutional COM stage. So a convolutional neural network is used to break them up into or to create an uh, embedding for each of the different patches then each of those different patches are concatenated with a position embedding, right, which represents um, where in the image they are, so one through nine for each of the nine patches, and then that gets fed into a transformer, uh, but before it's fed into that, it's concatenated with the embeddings coming out of the token, or coming out of the uh, sentence, right, where each word in that sentence is converted into a token and then each token is concatenated with its position inside the sentence and you concatenate that with the uh, embeddings and positioning tokens that are coming out of the image patches and you feed that into a transformer which encodes it into a little vector and then you have a decoder that then uh, decodes the little vector and the final task is uh, running happily on a dirt road. Running happily on a dirt road. Okay, so it's basically uh, taking or predicting kind of the net, the end of the sentence. This is probably the second half of the. Oh, that's kind of cool. I figured out what the shortcut is for zooming. This is probably the second half of the uh, caption for this image. So maybe they feed the first half of the caption. They, they uh, train to try to predict the second half of the caption. So again, every single one of these data sets is trained, or every single one of these models and in slightly different training uh, paradigms is based around a data set where you have images and you have captions. So. TLDR, all of these are basically different ways of training on the same type of data set where you have a, an image and then a corresponding caption from it. So there's still that kind of caveat and it kind of makes you wonder what does the uh, visual language data set of the future look like? Is it still going to be an image and a text caption or are we going to move to more complicated things such as uh, maybe the audio on a video? right taking the video and then uh, maybe taking the audio that comes with that video converting it to text uh, and then using that instead there's a lot of different potential data sets we could create right and it really comes down to 
what is the the format that is available, right? So in the internet, can you create data sets of images and captions? Can you create videos and captions to those videos, right? Like it, it, you're really trying to find some kind of format of data set of which you could collect huge amounts of data. Okay, here they, they talk about the pre-training data sets. So Coco has something like 113K images with 567K captions, CC3M, right, 3.1 million CC3M. Uh, Google research data sets, conceptual 12 million. CC12M is a data set with 12 million image text pairs meant to be used for vision and language pre-training. It is larger and covers a more diverse set of visual concepts than the conceptual captions, CC3M. That's quite cool. This is probably the go-to data set. Meant to be disjoint. Okay, these are their explanations of the stuff that we just went through. Data is oxygen. I kind of like that. So you have, they say, academic universities with limited computational research resources and then industrial setting where large-scale web crawl data sets. I would say academia is going to become increasingly irrelevant because these large-scale data sets are so much more important. CC12M, this is what we just saw. A larger version. localized narratives uh, clip is 400 million image text pairs so these are some of them this is actually kind of interesting where you see how some of these pairs are very small right so karate fight for this entire image Versus here, portrait of a great blue heron standing on a tree branch with one leg tucked up inside. A great blue heron stands on a tree buff with one leg against the background. I think this is a much richer description of this image versus here you have a very simple description of this image, right? You could say two men uh, fighting karate. Uh, one of them is hitting the other one. They're wearing blue gloves. They have black belts. Like, there's so much more sent information you could fit into this, and that's maybe one of the things we could do to improve these data sets is actually just add better and better and better descriptions and then that'll allow you to get a more rich text embedding for the corresponding image embedding. Data set used in a line has 1.8 billion text image pairs. And Wikipedia based image text data set, WIT, is composed of 11.5 million unique images and 37.6 million texts. Uh, text in different languages. Okay, then you have Leon. 400 million, 5 billion text image pair. So you can kind of see everything's starting to get pretty serious here. You're getting, you're getting billion. We're in the low single digit billions when it comes to training set, training data set size here. So you can only imagine what's going to happen when we go to 50 billion or hundreds, trillions of images, right? It's 
12 million, so this is comparatively tiny. And then you have another web crawled 12 billion. inappropriate content including pornographic images is porn inappropriate or do you think that the AI models should also learn about porn I would say that we want our AI models to know about porn I think that there's a lot of information there scale is believed to be important I don't know if it's believed to be important. I think it's confirmed to be important. Um, right, you have uh, GPT-3 with its 175 billion parameters. And then you have Palm with 540 billion parameters. Uh, most big VLP models are trained with contrastive pre-training or generative pre-training. Okay, so here you have different models. The size of the image encoders, the size of the model, the uh, fusion, so total. Model size, pre-training data set size, and pre-training task. Note that some of the numbers shown are based on our best estimate. Okay, so what is the largest out of all of these models? So the smallest one out of all of these is CLIP with 425 million parameters. And the biggest one of all of these is P-A-L-I, Pali, with 16.9 billion parameters. This is huge. Then we have the total data set size. Total data set sizes for pre-training. We have CLIP is trained on 400 million. Let's close out of that. CLIP is trained on 400 million. And the biggest one we have here is this here. 12.9 billion. Uh, here you have 16.9 billion. These are all really recent papers too, 2022. In context, few shot learning. It is more desirable to train a model that can quickly adapt to different downstream tasks via only providing a few in context examples, right? So it's like you want to have just this general feature encoder, this big feature encoder that you can then fine tune for your specific task. Okay, so Frozen uses a large Frozen language model and learns an image encoder to align the embedding space of images and text via simple image captioning task. Yeah, so it's basically like different ways of learning these encoders and you could have a text encoder that's frozen. So you, you use a text encoder from say GPT-3, you freeze it and then you basically have this kind of like student teacher 
training situation going on where the, the text embedding corresponding to the image caption is used to kind of shape the image embedding. And then the image encoder, all it's really doing is it's learning to project an image into an embedding space that is as similar as possible to the embedding space of the text, right? So if in the embedding space of your text, the words king and queen are, are close together, then in the embedding space of your image that is trained to match that, the features for a king and the features for the queen are going to be similar, close together. I would say this is probably not the way to go. I think the like embedding space of text is going to be different from the optimal embedding space of image, and I think training them in jointly is probably the way to go. That That's going to result in a more interesting space, but there's still challenges on that. Uh, Git and Flamingo, Decoder Fusion, right, some of these do both of them. And contrastive pre-training, generative pre-training, B. Uh, additional pre-training losses such as masked language modeling and um, ITM, which is maybe the image masking. Joint contrastive and generative pre-training. Okay. So different combinations of these different ideas. So you have your donut on a plate. Open-ended text generation. Okay, so going from the image just to the jet to the uh, caption. This is visual question answering. Box dash mask localization. So you have a part of the image, and then you're like, what is this part of the image? So it's like visual. It's like kind of like captioning, but for a specific part of an image. And then pixel prediction. I don't know what this is. Maybe they masked out part of the image and they're predicting it there. Unified image text modeling. The model cannot be end-to-end -end pre trained and results in suboptimal downstream performance. Good to know. Uh, through the use of ve vector quantized VAE, images can be also represented as a sequence as of discrete image tokens. Right, this is kind of quantizing the embedding space into a discrete. Uh, set of tokens, which you can think of as your image vocabulary. Um, I don't know if this necessarily makes things better. Uh, I think it's like a regularization loss, effectively. You can think of it as a type of regularization that people put on these embedding spaces to quantize them, and then in the case of language, it's convenient because then you can kind of have a one-to-one -one mapping of like a specific area of an embedding space and then a token that you can actually then say this, anything that, any vector that is close to this uh, part of the embedding space corresponds to the word dog, right? So even if you're a little bit off, even if the vector is slightly different in different inference steps, it'll you can always say, okay, but this is closest to this vector here in our vocabulary which corresponds to dog. But I don't know if these kind of quantizing the embedding space of a vision model, which is more 
like pixels are pixels and vision are not naturally discretized versus like text is naturally discretized you know in its in its raw form text is discretized in, into like letters and into words and those words are the same from uh one sentence to another but i don't think the same thing applies in images so i don't know just a meta comment there that maybe it's not the best idea There are two categories of knowledge sources, explicit, structured, symbolic knowledge bases, such as Wikipedia, ConceptNet, and Google Images, and then implicit, unstructured knowledge bases, such as large-scale pre-trained language models. Okay. So, yeah, this kind of, like, knowledge-based is this two-step approach where... It's about retrieving knowledge from uh, external knowledge source, like a database, although uh, in this case they, they say they're using something like Wikipedia, or they can even use uh, another language model, and then use that to... get the actual answer you want. So you can prompt GPT-3 via the use of image captioning and in-context view shot learning to get state-of-the-art results. Robustness and probing analysis. Uh, okay, so the standard benchmark is VQA V2, uh, NLVR2, Some big VLP models have even surpassed human performance on some of these tasks. It remains unclear how robust these pre-trained models are. Okay, we review popular approaches to robustness analysis, and then this is kind of maybe how they generalize, how they measure robustness. I, I like this. I think robustness is often kind of used as a catch-all term, and then kind of being more explicit about the different types of robustness, I think is useful. Uh, here, diagnostic tests, uh, out of distribution generalization, uh, performance uh, to, or kind of the susceptibility to human adversarial attacks and then whatever probing analysis is so there's a couple different data sets that people have made uh, such as clever uh, and gqa little tests and benchmarks that are meant to kind of sometimes be adversarial where they ask things that are kind of tricky and then see if the model can generalize to that and one of the most popular VQA data sets that is designed to test the auto distribution generalization models is VQA CP. So it reshuffles examples in VQA V2. And then someone made adversarial VQA. Non-expert annotators can easily attack modern VLP models.
yeah so again just kind of rephrasing what we already did image text data is more useful for pure computer vision tasks than just pure computer vision data model compression pruning this is taking a, a model and getting rid of weights that are small so that you can reduce the total amount of parameters inside a model look at this they have a little tree here representative object detection based and end-to-end -end vision language prediction models advanced topics efficient adaptation parameter efficient adaptation of large language models for downstream tasks Okay, so when you're fine-tuning a large pre-trained transformer on a downstream task, that transformer can have a huge amount of model parameters, right? And even performing just a few gradient updates on that huge set of model parameters can take a lot of time and require a lot of big GPUs and, and so on. So kind of something that's being explored here which is interesting is hey you freeze actually the majority of the pre-trained model and you're just learning uh, specific uh, uh, layers that are either at the end or at the beginning of the model ladder side tuning it's kind of cool never heard of that Multilingual. This is cool. I mean, I think this could be a way to, to get that to the trillion data points that we're looking at, right? I think that maybe the total size of the English internet will only get you billions of image text pairs, but if you want trillions of image text pairs, you'll have to go into the Chinese language internet or the Indian language internet. Unsupervised. I would say that if you're interested in unsupervised uh, vision stuff, definitely check out um, meta research, especially Detter, D-E-T-R. That's, I think, one of the cooler stuff I've seen. Okay, actually interesting here. On the other hand, paired image text data is actually not very difficult to collect and scale up, and there already exist many such large-scale image text data sets. Socratic models. Different models store different forms of knowledge across different domains. composing different foundation models no I would say that this is a red herring you don't want to have this is again thinking that breaking things down into individual tasks will result in better performance when in reality you're going to get better performance by combining all the tasks together and making an even bigger model so that's kind of my bias take on that text to image generation
Okay, we're almost at the end of chapter three. So let's let's push through here. So we have figure 311, an illustration of discrete token based, right? So discrete token is uh, what we were talking about where you take the embeddings, the, the embedding space, which is continuous and you discretize it into different areas. And then each of those areas is represented by one token. Uh, diffusion models again in diffusion models you're adding noise and then removing the noise and then the model learns how to remove noise even when there might not be noise to begin with and that's how you generate new things so here we have kind of a VQ VAE kind of setup where you have an input image uh, you encode it into discrete visual tokens and then you train a decoder to take those discrete visual tokens and reconstruct the whole image and you train it with the reconstruction loss. Uh, the diffusion model here, uh, let's start with the autoregressive model. So in the autoregressive model you have a sentence, you tokenize it uh, into a series of tokens then you take the visual token decoder, which goes from those text tokens into visual tokens, and then uh, from those visual tokens, you go to the actual image. Uh, this is not actually a result. This is just showing you what it would look like, but that was not actually generated from uh, DALI. This is not a DALI generated image. Uh, diffusion models, you go from the sentence into tokens, those tokens into uh, vectors, which is the text embedding. That text embedding, uh, you take it, I don't know what this prior model means, but you basically say, okay, this is the text embedding, this is the image embedding, and you tell the model, I want to remove the noise through an iterative set of, set of steps in order to generate the image, and the model will just remove those uh, remove the noise from this vector, which, by the way, is just a random vector, and then produce a text or an image embedding which represents that image. Discrete token. Dali demonstrates that training a large scale autoregressive transformer on numerous image text pairs can result in high fidelity generative model with controllable synthesis results through text prompts. Right. Here we have stable diffusion. What is Finaki? A model for generating videos from text that can change over time. Finaki, variable length video generation from open domain textual descriptions. Maybe it's worth reading this paper in the future. These are still pretty rough, but it's still pretty cool. Nuwa, Dolly, Dolly 2.
Diffusion models such as denoising diffusion probabilistic models have achieved great success in image generation tasks. Yeah, so you can perform diffusion in pixel space, or you can uh, perform diffusion in the actual lat continuous latent space of the image itself. Progressing at a rapid speed. Yeah, video generation is coming soon. Within a year or two, I think we'll have it. All right, and then we have chapter four. I think we're going to leave this one for uh, later in the week because we're already over two and a half hours. So that's as far as we're getting today. Uh, we've been looking at vision language pre-training, basics, advanced, and future trends uh, from Microsoft. This is a summary paper on vision and language and their combination. So thanks for listening, 